Hello and welcome to my review of Blue Reflection Second Light. All of the gameplay you'll see in this video was captured on a PlayStation 5 console, but the game's available on PlayStation 4, Nintendo Switch, and PC as well. Also, I need to inform you that a review code was provided to me by Koei Tecmo. And of course, remember, if you do enjoy this video or you find it useful, please do consider subscribing to the channel for more content like this. So what is Blue Reflection Second Light? Well, it's a sequel to the 2017 game simply titled Blue Reflection, and it's somewhat of a traditional JRPG that, like its predecessor, provides a story that focuses on personal growth and sharing experiences with other human beings. You play as the main protagonist, Ao Hoshizaki, who, while on her way to summer school, is transported to a strange and unknown world. The place she finds herself in takes the form of an academy or a school that seems to be floating out in the middle of an ocean. Very soon after arriving, she meets three other girls that have been seemingly trapped here for quite a while. They're named Yuki, Reina, and Kokoro. Unfortunately, these girls seem to have lost their memories and they don't really know who they are or remember anyone that they knew or anything about the world that they came from. And so, you all set out on a journey to restore their memories, figure out what's going on, and return home. You can divide the game up into three main sections. The school, Heartscapes and the battle screen. The school itself acts as your sort of home base where you can engage with many of the game's side systems. You can craft various items using materials you find in the world which are used for healing, buffing, constructions and more. Speaking of constructions, you can build a lot of different structures that can be placed around the school which give the characters passive bonuses. They can also be upgraded and placed as sets which further increases their effect. You then have the fragment system which is essentially a type of equipment that increases your character's abilities. Each character has various fragment slots where you can equip the fragments that you found to them. When slotted, the fragments grant a wide range of bonuses from attack power to better recovery from healing skills and everything in between. You'll also be able to unlock more slots so that you can equip more fragments. As you play through the game, the girls at the school will often have a request for you to take on. These function like optional side quests and can have you doing simple things like gathering materials, killing a certain amount of monsters, or building specific structures. Upon completing these requests, you're usually rewarded with talent points, or TP for short. You can spend these talent points on various permanent ability upgrades for each character, which can be things like extra defense, quicker XP gains, or new skills to use in battle. Each girl has four types of talent upgrades, allowing you to push them towards a specific role, like DPS or healer, for example. Another way to earn talent points is to go on what the game calls dates with other characters. These aren't really supposed to be romantic dates, but rather hanging out with friends and getting to know them better. As you strengthen the bonds between the main character and the others, they'll gain TP for you to spend on talents and also unlock the other talent types. There's also a smartphone that you can use to talk to other characters and accept their requests without having to go and talk to them, as well as a locker room where you can change the character's clothes and a map function that allows you to fast travel around the school and to individual characters' locations. The second main section of the game is the Heartscapes, which are essentially this game's name for the dungeons that you fight through. These are the places where you find a lot of the materials for the crafting and the monsters or demons as they're referred to here. During the story, you'll make your way through these areas while stopping for cutscenes and dialogue that moves the narrative along, and you'll have to fight mini-bosses and main bosses near the end of the level. After a Heartscape has been cleared in the story, you can go back to it whenever you like and look for items and collectibles that you perhaps didn't get the first time round, or you can farm for XP and loot drops. As you explore the Heartscapes, you'll see enemy monsters wandering about, and if you walk into them, you'll be taken to the battle screen. You can avoid the enemies if you want to, but you can also get an advantage in battle if you sneak up behind them and hit them with your weapon to initiate the battle. There's also some areas in the Heartscape that are blacked out on your first visit and require a certain item to get into. For example, there could be a fallen tree that's blocking your path and you'd need a special axe to get through it. There's also a few stealth sections that have you crouching and sneaking past enemies, but these are relatively rare. While in this crouch state, you can see the enemy's aggro range in red, and you can avoid them as necessary. You can also crawl under specific buildings and climb ladders to avoid detection if need be. Sadly, I can't really say too much more about these areas and how they connect to the school or the characters without spoiling anything. A huge part of this game's narrative is the mystery surrounding why everything's happening, and I really wouldn't want to ruin it for anyone. Another section of the game you'll be spending a lot of time in is the battle screen. If you've played the first game, you'll know that the girls wear special rings which allow them to conjure unique weapons and transform into powerful reflectors. Becoming a reflector is sort of like a super form where the girls become much stronger. It's a similar idea to a Super Saiyan transformation from the Dragon Ball series, or perhaps it's closer to the girls from Sailor Moon due to the costume change. 
The battles themselves appear turn-based at first glance, but actually they combine aspects of real-time and turn-based combat into a timeline battle system. During a battle, each character will automatically recover ether points. The more ether points they gain, the further they can move along the timeline. Once certain thresholds are passed on the timeline, you can activate a skill, which pauses time and will cost that character a certain amount of ether points. When a skill's been used, the ether points are spent, which pushes back the character on the timeline. And of course, the more ether points a skill costs to use, the stronger it is generally. Each time a character uses a skill, it increases that character's ether point gain or ether point recovery as it's called in this game. And that encourages you to use a lot of smaller and quicker attacks, at least at first. When you increase a character's ether point recovery, speed to a certain point, you'll go up a gear which represents your character really getting into the flow of the battle, and it allows you to launch multiple attacks at once. When a character reaches gear 3, they will transform into a reflector, gaining power and unlocking stronger skills. And there are of course some other minor systems and mechanics that open up as you progress through the game, but they are linked to the story so I won't go into them here. Just know that there is a little bit more to the game than I've mentioned. However, at this point you should have a pretty decent idea of what the game's about and how it works, so let's move on to the personal opinion section, starting with the positives. As always, this isn't an exhaustive list, it's just stuff that stood out to me, and the same's true of the negative section. So then, what did I enjoy about the game? Well, I was a big fan of the original Blue Reflection. I thought that it was, you know, relatively similar to other JRPGs, but it somehow felt fresh and a little bit more approachable than other similar games. You know when you play something like Persona 5 and the game has long sections of just building up characters through interactions and dialogue? Well, that's what the first Blue Reflection was like for me. And although the game wasn't anywhere near as long as Persona 5, it still connected me the characters and the mystery of the story. I'm genuinely happy to say that I think the sequel lives up to that standard, and not only that, it changes up the mystery, adds lots of new characters, and expands on the gameplay. To me, that's exactly what a sequel should be doing. I don't necessarily need my sequels to be bigger, better, and louder than the original. I'm just happy when they give me more of the same thing, but, you know, change it up a little bit and just creatively expand on their previous work. If I was going to be specific, I would say that the story, the mystery, and the characters are the things that really shine the most, at least as far as my experience was concerned. The voices in the game are all Japanese with no English dub, and of course, those of you that follow my channel know that I'm kind of weird and almost always prefer dubs. I don't know why, I just do. However, when a dub isn't available, I am more than happy to read the subtitles and listen to the Japanese voice actors, who, by the way, do a brilliant job of conveying the emotions of the characters. It doesn't matter if it's a sad and somber scene or a really happy and sweet moment. It's all just very well done and the music really rounds it all out. It really is a shame that I can't talk too much about the story because I really want to talk about it, but what I can say is that if you take the time to really read and listen to what the characters are saying, it really becomes a very intimate and meaningful, worthwhile and moving story and it's a big part of the game's appeal in my opinion. In terms of visual quality and graphical fidelity, I don't think it looks that great. Although there is definitely some really well designed and atmospheric places to visit, and honestly, I think it looks perfectly fine for this type of game. I mean, yeah, it doesn't look like Tales of Arise or something like that, but it's generally pretty nice and it runs absolutely fine. I will say though, the character designs and the in-game models look really nice in my opinion. And yeah, I can see you guys out there saying, well, Stu, yep, yeah, we know what you're like. <laughs> you, you obviously like the characters. I mean, yeah, you're not wrong, okay? I do like the uh, attractive female characters, sure, I can't lie about that. But they are very well designed and the 2D renders of them that you see in the menus are of a very high quality. And the last thing I want to talk about in this section is the battle system. I don't think I've ever played a game with a battle system that has so many mechanics and subsystems to consider, but also feels incredibly simple to play at the same time. I suppose the game just explains itself very well, and the game does introduce you to these aspects of combat over time, which helps you retain the information. I think the skills and attacks are overall pretty cool, and the reflector transformations are awesome. I've said it a few times over the last year, but I really like the tokusatsu shows, which are essentially live-action drama shows with characters who transform into heroes, you know, things like Power Rangers or Kamen Rider. And also, I was a fan of the original Sailor Moon anime back in the day, and I think both of the Blue Reflection games take elements from both of these things. And I don't know, I, I guess it just kind of speaks to me a bit more because I like the theme. But of course, if you're someone who doesn't really care about those kind of things, then you're probably not going to be quite as enamored with the game and the theme as I am. But it is what it is, and I quite like it. And so as you can tell, I am quite happy with the game, and I do rate it highly. But like anything else, it's not perfect. So let's talk about some negatives. 
So I genuinely think this game is good. I really do, at least as far as my tastes go, and generally I don't really have too much to say in regards to negatives. That said, I do have a few things I'd like to talk about that could perhaps irritate or bother certain players, and I think this first one is quite important. As I mentioned at the start of the video, I was given a review code for this game by Koei Tecmo themselves, but when I redeemed that code, I was surprised to find that the code I was given was for the ultimate edition of the game, which is not cheap, let me tell you. It costs around £95 in the UK and around $115 in the US. I just wanted to be really upfront and honest with you about that before I say anything else. And getting a game like that for free isn't something that's going to affect my review of it, you know? I just, I just really needed to get that out there. And I think you guys know me by now, if I like something, I'll say so, and if I don't like something, I'll tell you about it. Plus, I like to do it in a respectful way. I'm not sure if the PR team at Koei Tecmo watches these videos to check on the review as they give codes to, but if they do, let me just say that viewers want honesty and integrity when it comes to game reviews, and I know for a fact that they respect people who are genuine. And with that in mind, let's talk about the game's monetization. The standard edition of the game is a simple full price game. Nothing wrong with that, I think the game is pretty great and it's worth your time and money, at least in my opinion. However, there's also quite a few minor things you can buy individually or in the Deluxe Edition or Ultimate Edition, which basically bundle all of these smaller DLC pieces into one place. Now, as always, I'm going to say it's your money and I'm not going to tell you how to spend it. All I can do is give my opinions and views on these things. I can't force people to do things and I wouldn't want to either. But I'll say right now that I'm not overly impressed with the DLC that's on offer here. A lot of it is just simple costumes, which in a completely single player game should just be in the game from the get-go if you ask me. On top of that, there's also a season pass which promises even more costumes and a few extra maps and levels to play through, which do look like they have some story content so that is pretty cool. Normally if you want the season pass you'll either have to buy the full game and then buy the season pass separately or just get the ultimate edition. The main issue with it for me is that the Ultimate Edition is nearly double the price of the full game for, you know, some costumes and a few maps. It just doesn't have the value, it just doesn't feel right to me. And I suppose if it were up to me, I would have done away with the Deluxe and the Ultimate Editions completely and then just add all the costumes into the game as standard. Then focus the extra development time into making a lot more story content for a medium to large size paid expansion. I mean, when it comes down to it, I don't really mind costumes, and I actually like larger meaningful expansions, but in my opinion, it just needs to be streamlined and consumer-friendly. And please don't get me wrong, I am really grateful to be granted a code for something like this, but after looking into what it contained, I just don't think the Ultimate or Deluxe Editions offer enough value for that price. I really like the main game, it's great, it really is, but I think the extra digital content is very expensive for what you get. Now moving on to the game itself, I personally didn't have that much to dislike, but I do think there's some aspects that may bother some players out there. For example, if you like JRPGs but you aren't really into the story or the pace at which it's told, you might find that it's very slow going. You do spend a lot of time at the school upgrading it, talking with the characters and managing your party. It's not a case of back to the school for a minute and then quickly back out into the combat again. At times I felt like the narrative was delivered like a visual novel, with lots of heavy dialogue that doesn't really progress the story too much, but instead fleshes out the characters' personalities. Now of course I really loved that aspect of it, I found it to be quite engaging, but if you're playing for the combat and the exploration and all that kind of stuff, more than the character interactions, I could see you find it perhaps a little bit dull. You may even slip into that state where you just skip through all the dialogue just so you can get to the next section and move on, which I think is fair. I could also see some players being a bit disappointed with the graphical fidelity in specific situations. As I said previously, I think it looks fine, it does what it needs to do, and it is a last-gen game with no dedicated PS5 version, so I kind of get it. But for every time you come across a really beautiful scene with warm lighting and well-detailed backgrounds, you'll find something that doesn't look quite right just waiting around the corner. Here you can see some really low-res textures, and the seam where they join is very obviously placed, and doesn't match, which is a bit of a shame. I just feel like the environmental artists could have done a slightly better job with these things, as they are quite common. But I really don't want to be a backseat developer. These people work long hours, they have deadlines, and they do what they're told. So you can't always be too harsh about something like this, unless it's really offensively ugly to look at, which this game isn't. Overall, I'm actually pretty happy with how it looks, but I could see some people being unhappy with it. 
And lastly, I just wanted to bring up the fan service side of the Blue Reflection games. A lot of anime-based games like this have a certain type of fan service, and by that I mean suggestive themes, spicy dialogue, or partial nudity. As far as I'm aware, this game has been kept uncensored from its Japanese release, although in the changing rooms you aren't allowed to tilt the camera for, shall we say, certain viewing angles. I'm not 100% sure if they locked the camera in the Western release as I'm playing this game before its official release, but I did think it was worth mentioning. I'm personally against censorship of any kind in games because at the end of the day it's a cartoon girl, right? Who cares? If a few unstable people act like perverts after playing this kind of game, perhaps the blame should be placed on the small amount of human beings who couldn't control themselves over the game that millions of people played without any issue. I don't know, just a thought. But yeah, besides the monetization, the slow pace, and the uneven visuals, I'd say that about does it for the negatives, so let's move on to the conclusion and recommendation section. In my opinion, Blue Reflection Second Light is a solid JRPG experience with an engaging personal story that I wanted to see through to the end. It has a lot of gameplay systems all working together, but it never felt overwhelming, and it was really satisfying and enjoyable to unravel the mystery. I would honestly be comfortable and confident to recommend this to anyone who enjoys JRPGs or really just RPGs in general. I think if you have an interest in animes like Sailor Moon or the magical girl genre, then you'll definitely get more mileage from it and probably connect to the theme a little bit more, but I'd say it's worth your time either way. Of course, it goes without saying that if you're not into JRPGs or anime-style games, it's probably not going to be for you, and I don't think this is one of those games that will suddenly convert you into a fan of them. But if you're looking at this and you're thinking about buying it because it looks good to you, then I would say go for it. I found it to be a very enjoyable game, and from a technical standpoint, it's solid. Plus, if you're still not sure, there is a free demo available that allows you to play the first section of the game, which is called the prologue. The demo also has another random part of the story for you to try out, but I would advise against playing that part of the demo, just because it contains characters that you don't meet until later in the main game. I don't think you absolutely need to, but I would also suggest playing the first game if you can get hold of it for a good price, mainly because it'll give you a lot more context about what's going on in Second Light, but I don't think it's required. Ultimately, I really like the game. It's an easy RPG to recommend. I mean, sure, it's a bit slow at times and there is a lot to take in, but if you can just let yourself settle into the story and really engage with all of its systems, I think you'll find yourself in the middle of a very heartfelt and worthwhile RPG. So there you go, that's my review of Blue Reflection Second Light. It's available November 8th, 2021 for PS4, PS5 via backwards compatibility, Nintendo Switch, and PC. Once again, thank you to Koei Tecmo for providing the review code. It is very encouraging to see larger companies supporting smaller content creators like myself and giving us a chance. It's very much appreciated. If you have any questions or perhaps there was something that I missed that you'd like to know about, please feel free to leave a comment and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. If you enjoyed the video or found it useful, I hope today will be the day that I earn your subscription, and if you want to support the channel even further, all the important links are in the video description down below. But with all that said, thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.